Uh, my name is Felicity Harris and I work at Plant Life and I'm really delighted today to have the opportunity um, to have Dr. Sipi Arthvik from the University of Tartu in Estonia join us to talk to us about her research on cowslips, which has been going on for a, a couple of years. And um, what we're going to hear about today is the cowslip, is about her community science project, which is uh, being run in Estonia, but is now uh, being sort of spread throughout Europe. We were delighted back in September when Sippy contacted us and said, would Plant Life like to help support this important research um, in the UK? And we said, yes, of course we would, because this research that Sippy is going to tell us about um, helps us understand about grass, grasslands. And as many of you will know, um, one of Plant Life's big ambitions at the moment is to see species rich grassland restored across the UK. So a couple of introductions from me. We have Dr. Sipi Arvik from uh, Estonia, as I've mentioned, Mary Grace Rao from Plant Life. Mary Grace has been developing an app that we hope will inspire, help many of you who are inspired by this presentation go out in the warmer months of April and May and help collect data on cowslips to help us understand more about grasslands. And we have Matt Pitts here, Plant Life's Meadows Advisor, who's joining us today to answer any questions you may have about grasslands in the UK. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand you over to Sippy. Uh, during the talk, uh, during Sippy's presentation, you won't be able to see Mary Grace, Matt, or me. We'll be disappearing into the background, um, but we'll be there to uh, on answer the chat, monitor the chat, monitor the questions, and we'll be rejoining you in about 45 minutes time. Thank you. I will now start sharing my screen. I hope now you can see my screen. Hello, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Felicity, and thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, our research on, uh, on grasslands and uh, cowslips in Estonia, but I think uh, as, um, as you also mentioned that plant life's uh, aim now is to see meadows flourishing again. Um, uh, we have the same problems in Estonia and the same problems are occurring elsewhere in other European countries. And, uh, and I will introduce in a minute uh, make an introduction to these uh, grasslands uh, ecology and grasslands in Estonia, grasslands in uh, in Europe, and then uh, we'll see uh, where uh, and how cowslips come into play. So I myself am a plant ecologist in the University of Tartu, Estonia, um, with a focus on on conservation issues. So we work a lot ourselves with uh, conservation practitioners. Uh, we do applied research, but I myself also um, try to use also modern uh, tools, uh, genetics and uh, genomics. And this is how I, I encountered uh, this, this interesting, peculiar uh, trait of cowslips, which I will introduce uh, in a moment. So uh, a very brief introduction to uh, grasslands uh, and uh, traditionally managed seminatural grasslands or wildflower meadows. Um, yes, as, as you already mentioned, Felicity, uh, they are very um, unique, they're valuable, and uh, we aim to, uh, to restore uh, these habitats, which have once been uh, very uh, common in, throughout Europe, and um, 
and they have lost most of their area, unfortunately, throughout uh, Europe. Uh, this is why for fundamental research, it is an, a good, so-called good system that uh, we can uh, use grasslands as a, as, a, as a model to see what happens to, to biodiversity when uh, habitats uh, drastically uh, collapse, their area collapses and the, the connectivity uh, decreases. So what happens to biodiversity of different species, species diversity, as well as genetic diversity? Uh, but uh, they are also uh, very um, important from conservation point of view. They host many species, as mentioned, and uh, we have been used, uh, or we are used in the knowledge that, uh, that tropical rainforests are uh, really top diverse habitats in the world. But uh, when we look at uh, uh, at other scales. Uh, so here is one overview or, or a graph uh, with world records of vascular plant species richness. Uh, you see that uh, these grey dots here, they are uh, tropical uh, rainforests. But when we come to uh, smaller scales, for example, uh, one square meter, uh, 10 square meters, or or, or even smaller, you see, you can have really, really tiny plots, what the vegetation ecologists are trying to uh, look at. You see that these, these green ones, these are grasslands, and many of them are temperate grasslands. Uh, for example, the really tiny dots originate from Germany. Then we have Swedish grasslands, Czech grasslands, Estonian uh, wooded meadows. And uh, certainly somewhere here are also uh, uh, English uh, grasslands as well with their high diversity. And just an, an example from Estonian, uh, most uh, species rich in terms of pastoral plants, uh, species rich uh, communities, uh, wooded meadows. So our record uh, in Estonia for one square meter uh, is 76 uh, species of vascular plants. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, really a lot and you can have even like smaller squares 20 to 20 and have 42 species of vascular plants. So in the small uh, area uh, at small scale, these temperate grasslands are top or really in the top world records. So they are very valuable. And, uh, and uh, besides uh, plant species, which create uh, habitats uh, for many, many other species, uh, many insect species. These uh, grasslands are also very important for our own well-being. And uh, you might have heard the word or expression ecosystem services, which is not uh, very, well, very, very nice expression, but this is what the grasslands actually provide us, uh, ecosystem services or nature's benefits. Uh, for example, through providing habitats to many insect groups, uh, which are also very important uh, pollinators, pollinating insects, including butterflies and uh, bumblebees, uh, who help to pollinate uh, many important uh, food crops. Here's uh, on the right side, you see a, 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 a comparison. Uh, what would happen if we didn't um, have pollinators? What would we see in our shops shelves? And an important thing is that this service cannot be provided by uh, honeybees only, that at least half of this pollination is carried out by wild bees, so wild pollinating insects. And for these insects, uh, the semi-natural grassland, the traditional grasslands, but also other semi-natural uh, grassland type of habitats, uh, also in modern landscapes, such as road verges and field boundaries and ditch verges, where grassland species can also grow, are very, very, uh, very important for these um, for these insects as well. But there are then there are also other other very important uh, aspects such as uh, grasslands' uh, cultural role and aesthetic role in in our life. And uh, when uh, in Estonia, what has happened that many of these grasslands uh, on more productive sites they have been uh, turned into intensively managed agricultural fields, while in uh, in less fertile areas they have overgrown with trees and bushes. And um, here you can see what happens to it. For example, to, to these um, pollinators, as well as uh, plants, when uh, open grasslands become overgrown, we lose 
many species and we lose also the, the, the abundance of these species is going down. And uh, here you see um, in this slide uh, a curve uh, depicting, depicting the loss in the area of Estonian uh, grasslands. And uh, over the past century, uh, while in the beginning of the 20th century, about one third of Estonia was covered by these grasslands. Then by now we have lost more than 95% of the original area. Uh, the most dominant grassland uh, or habitat was a wooded meadow, this exceptionally um, species rich uh, grassland. And, uh, and now we have basically nothing left. We have only a few hundreds uh, of wooded meadows uh, in, in good condition and managed. And, uh, and I don't have the specific data for UK, but uh, looking at the headlines, from uh, the newspapers, I uh, I know I have seen <laughs> that uh, that uh, it is it is the same uh, for 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 English grasslands or for the, the other grasslands in UK, and, and the the loss of the magnitude of the loss has been more or less the same. Maybe it even might have started even earlier in in, in parts of the Europe, but we are all uh, facing the same problems. Uh, regarding ross and ross uh, throughout Europe. And um, there are some species which are still being kind of considered common, such as Trollius europeus in Latin, I can't remember English name, Primula farinosa, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in some parts also cowslips that uh, used to be common and they are considered to be common, but when you go out and try to look for them, then the, you, you cannot find any. And our uh, parents' generation, for example, as uh, starting to question that where did all the flowers go? Where, where have, what, what happened? And this is related to this, uh, this drastic uh, grassland loss um, yeah, all across Europe and in Estonia as well. So here you see also the same, uh, the same uh, on the map, uh, spatially, uh, the distribution of grasslands uh, in 1950s. Uh, it, they were quite abundant still before the big intensification of agriculture started. And at landscape scale, what we saw that, uh, that uh, grasslands were still large and uh, well connected when you uh, look at this two by two uh, kilometer plot where, uh, where uh, we have grasslands depicted with a dark green. And here you see an old historical photo of, uh, of one of the calcareous grasslands. And um, within 50, 60, 70 years, we have lost all, all of this, you see. And what has happened at landscape scale is that these grasslands, uh, they are uh, very, very small often. Um, and they have uh, lost connections uh, to the other uh, grasslands in the landscape. And so they have become isolated. And the populations in these grasslands have become isolated and uh, don't have any uh, possibility to, to, to communicate with other grasslands, to uh, exchange genes. Uh, this is what I do, I study how much plants exchange genes between these uh, grassland patches. And as I said, the main uh, impact or the main reason for the loss has been uh, land use change, either intensification or abandonment of uh, traditional management practices. Um, I just okay. <laughs> I don't look at the questions at the moment. Uh, let's come to back to back to the questions later on. Uh, so just a glimpse at uh, Estonian uh, main grasslands, uh, which might be also familiar to you. I assume some of these at least. So we have still, fortunately, thousands of hectares of floodplain meadows left at the, at the banks of uh, larger uh, rivers. And uh, these meadows have unique, unique uh, flora because they are uh, flooded each spring regularly. But they are also very important habitats and the feeding places uh, for, for birds, feeding places during migration as well as, uh, as for nesting. Uh, no, something okay. 
now we see coastal meadows, I hope. Oh, already, this is wooded on coastal meadows. Uh, at, at the coastal areas, we have uh, vast areas of coastal meadows. Uh, according to some uh, statistics, uh, Estonia has the largest coastal meadow uh, in Europe. So you see a bit of sea on the left. And uh, so these, uh, these vast areas, they are under the influence of, uh, of uh, sea water, salty sea water. So you can uh, see uh, uh, and notice uh, plant species which are accustomed to such a bit salty conditions. Um, and then uh, this is our mm, most, let's say, uh, well-known and representative wooded meadow. Uh, where uh, we recorded this uh, world uh, record and where we also recorded 76 vascular plants per, per square meter. And uh, this picture has been taken in, uh, in spring. So the, particularly in spring, it's, it's a very nice. Uh, you, 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 you really see these old uh, characteristic uh, trees, it's often uh, oak trees, but also some other birches and some other old trees. Uh, creating this uh, kind of uh, fairy tale uh, environment, and um, yes, uh, wooded meadows was one of the reasons why I went to biology and became a plant ecologist. Actually, so they are to blame, and they harbor a lot of species and they harbor a lot of uh, rarities as well. Uh, currently, uh, our work is taking place on another type of grasslands, uh, which we call alvar grasslands. Uh, they are calcareous grasslands, uh, which are occurring uh, on, on very thin soil layer. So you see, uh, sometimes even you can see the bedrock, the calcareous uh, limestone bedrock. And uh, the soil layer is thin, so it can be up to 20 centimeters. And this uh, environment also creates conditions for some um, characteristic uh, flora uh, to occur there. And it also offers uh, habitats for, for many lichen species, for example, and many, many rarities. So this is, a, uh, this is a system where we are working now. Um, these uh, grasslands, these calcareous alvar grasslands, uh, they have also experienced uh, a dramatic loss in the area. They mostly have uh, overgrown by uh, junipers. Um, they have not mostly, uh, they, they, they have not been taken into intensive agricultural use due to uh, very low productivity, this thin soil layer. Uh, therefore, we still have uh, a few thousands of hectares of these grasslands left, but they are becoming overgrown and, uh, and, um, and the several restoration projects have taken place on these grasslands. You know, also uh, regarding restoration, that we just stepped to the into the into the decade of uh, of, of restoration, as uh, as was announced by uh, United Nations. So, uh, the restoration is a key word for this uh, for this decade. Uh, but the several restoration activities have taken place for a while already, all across Europe, uh, particularly on grassland systems. And, uh, and we are working in, in one of such systems uh, where um, financed uh, by European Union Life Programme, uh, thousands of hectares of alvar grasslands uh, were recently restored within the last uh, five years. Uh, so mostly it meant that uh, uh, junipers had to be removed and uh, farmers could then uh, go and uh, start using these areas as pastures and they were giving support, they were being given support to establish pastures, to build fences and, and so on. And the, we, our aim was to not only restore my patches of grasslands, but to really restore also connectivity and restore, um, restore networks of grasslands. And a few pictures about how, how it looked like. So before restoration, everything was covered by juniper bushes. And the same place after restoration, a couple of years after restoration, uh, when uh, grazing was uh, re restarted on these areas. Mostly that means in Estonia that we cut down uh, junipers. And, uh, um, and in most of the places, luckily, we still have seeds in the seed bank. 
but in some places where the seed bank is very impoverished and there are no characteristic grassland species to to uh, to revegetate the, the region, uh, also uh, the the uh, addition of, of seeds from nearby grasslands was was applied. And in this uh, system of uh, restored uh, and to be restored and overgrown grasslands, uh, we are working. Uh, we are examining different species groups. Um, you see birds, uh, insects, different insect groups, uh, um, vascular plants, lichens, uh, below ground, ground uh, biodiversity, such as the small, tiny uh, fungi, uh, mycorrhiza for, forming fungi, and so on, to see uh, what happens uh, when grasslands have overgrown and after restoration we want to see uh, how uh, diversity recovers and I have mostly looked at uh, the recovery uh, the loss and recovery of genetic diversity of grassland plants uh, and uh, one of these uh, one of the main or core species or focal species in our studies have over the past years been cowslip so the, the main hero of uh, today's uh, talk uh, just uh, in case you haven't seen cowslips uh, for a while, uh, this is how they look like. Uh, in Estonia, uh, there aren't many other uh, wild abrimoral species, but in maybe more to go into the south and to the west, uh, it, it is possible that there are some other other primulas, uh, uh, oxlips, prim primroses, which sometimes might be mistakenly uh, considered uh, uh, cowslips as they are like all in the in you know, they are all primulas when you uh, say in Latin. But the, but this is this is how a real cowslip uh, looks like. It's a common traditional characteristic grassland plant which has been widespread, but in some parts of Europe has been declining due to land use change and loss of grasslands. It's an insect pollinated uh, species, which means that. It really, really uh, requires pollinating insects to to um, to flourish. Uh, now, uh, coming uh, to to the core topic of today's talk, which uh, is uh, yes, I, well, it's not complicated. It's easy. <laughs> it is a uh, it concerns a, a a trait, a peculiar trait. Um, characteristic to uh, cowslips, but also to other uh, representatives of primula. Uh, it has to uh, do with uh, reproductive, uh, the, the replacement of reproductive organs in cowslip flowers. When you go to um, a, a population of, uh, of cowslips and uh, look closely at the flowers of cowslips, you may notice that they are not at all similar. Uh, particularly, uh, you may notice that uh, in some individuals you can see flowers uh, where you only uh, where, where you see uh, anthers, the, the uh, male reproductive organs, uh, while you can see that on, on the other cowslip individuals you only see a, a small dot. This is a female reproductive organ stigma or the, 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 the stigma of the part of the, of the style. So you either see usually only anthers or only uh, stigma, sorry. And, um, the, uh, but uh, both uh, of these flowers have both uh, type of female and uh, male reproductive organ present. Just in, in one case, these, uh, these anthers are in deep in the corolla, you cannot see when you look from above. And in the other case, this style is uh, is in the corolla, and you cannot uh, really see it very well. Uh, it, it has been called uh, 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 short style morph, so sh short short style morph in short S morph or S, and long long styled. So again, sorry, uh, long style uh, uh, L morph and uh, synonyms. Synonyms uh, we can also use uh, pin for L morphs and frum for S morphs. Uh, this uh, thing that uh, that uh, or, or this this feature uh, that 
house leaves can have such different uh, flowers morphologically uh, was noticed already a few hundreds of years ago. Uh, and then there were questions that are they different species or subspecies or what does it mean? And then a famous um, systematicist, Harold von Linné, suggested that, well, this flower enthusiast focused on the small floral details that no sane botanist would consider important. And so it remained like this. And then came along Charles Darwin. And, uh, and uh, as, a, as a keen observer of nature, also noticed that the cowslips have these uh, different flowers and he started to, to explore it. Uh, he was convinced that uh, it's not just for nothing, but that it needs to have some, some purpose, some meaning. And, uh, and uh, he made some experiments and he um, looked at cowslips, a lot of cowslips. He asked uh, his kids to bring hundreds of cowslip flowers and then he, he observed or found that that uh, roughly about half of the cowslips are have short styles, while the other half have lo long styles. And usually in, co uh, in cowslip populations, they occur with equal frequencies. And after some experiments and uh, and observations and uh, fertilization experiments, he he concluded that uh, uh, that th this. Uh, this kind of uh, feature helps to avoid cowslips from inbreeding. So these plants are not capable of fertilizing themselves first thing, and it enhances outcrossing. So, which means that basically that uh, the pollen from S morph cannot uh, fertilize another cowslip, uh, which has S morphs. This pollen from S morph needs to go, needs to arrive uh, on an individual which has L-morph uh, type of flowers and the other way around as well. So pollen from L-morphs need to access S-morph and only then uh, successful fertilization uh, can take place. And this is what Darwin found. And uh, this is uh, what he also years later uh, uh, remembered or, uh, in, in, or mentioned in his uh, memoirs that no little discovery of, of mine ever gave me so much pleasure as making out the meaning of heterostyle flowers. And it is really, uh, uh, I, I can uh, only, uh, only agree with him. And also sometimes uh, people say that, like particularly uh, animal ecologists have asked from us that, that, that uh, plants, uh, why do you examine plants? That uh, plants are or says they are so boring and and but but this uh, thing uh, this uh, this feature is one of examples which uh, describes that or or uh, illustrates that it's plants are not boring at all and and also plants uh, do care with whom whom they mate. Uh, as I said, as and as a, and Darwin observed and many others later on uh, these. Uh, uh, the frequencies of these S's and L's are generally uh, equal. So the ratio is one to one. Only then the, uh, the, the cowslips uh, populations are, or they have the highest uh, reproductive success because one uh, morph cannot fertilize the, the another same morph. So it needs to be more or less equal. Uh, we found in our study, looking in the same calcare salver grasslands and uh, collecting samples for genetic analysis that that, uh, that uh, we see deviation from these equal frequencies of S's and L's in small cowslip populations, while in larger cowslip populations, uh, thousands of individuals. This is more or less equal. And it has been found in other previous research as well that uh, when uh, grasslands decrease and costly populations uh, decrease as well. Uh, as a result, then the, uh, these uh, uh, different uh, S's and L's, the frequency of these morphs is deviating from these equal, equal frequencies. What does it mean for cowslip? It means that uh, there are fewer compatible mates for fertilization. So let's uh, imagine a situation and which is a which can happen in the field that you have only, let's say, uh, 20 L's and 80 S's. And, 
instead of 50-50, so it's much more difficult to find a uh, compatible mate. And this is also further intensified this pollen flow to the right mate uh, by loss of pollinators. As I said, that this uh, species is strictly de depending as, a, as an outcrossing species and not capable of self-fertilization. It depends on, on pollinators. And when there are less and fewer and fewer pollinators, then there's no pollen flow as well. And uh, it has been shown also that, uh, that we can well see that when these uh, more frequencies deviate, the more they deviate, the less uh, uh, cows lips are capable to effectively reproduce and they, they produce uh, less seeds. And there are other, uh, other parameters which are decreasing when these uh, ratios uh, go uh, or deviate. And what we found in our study was that also genetic diversity is decreased. So genetic diversity within populations, when you have low lowering or reduced genetic diversity, this suggests that these populations are, are maybe more vulnerable to all kinds of environmental disturbances, to also climate change, some other environmental impacts. And there are issues of inbreeding um, occurring and so on. So uh, we found that uh, in cow slips, uh, when these uh, more frequencies deviate uh, further from equal frequencies in one of the landscapes, we found that genetic diversity is also decreasing. So this is why we were started to wonder that uh, how maybe maybe uh, maybe you can use this uh, frequency or this ratio as kind of an indicator of uh, cowslip uh, well-being or an, uh, an indicator of the impact of, of uh, landscape change, how it impacts cowslips and cowslip as a um, typical grassland plant, insect pollinated grassland plant as many other grassland species, maybe it indicates some uh, helps to indicate the, the, the well-being of other plants as well, uh, grasslands, pl plants, and, and in general, the, the grasslands, let's say, health. Although this is, not, uh, this is something that needs to, be, needs to be, as a researcher, I must say, has to be checked for, but definitely this, uh, this is showing us something, this, uh, this ratio. And there, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, doing uh, these uh, observations of, uh, of more frequencies at larger scale uh, started to germinate and we introduced it to uh, Estonia Fund for Nature, uh, who became fascinated uh, about this idea. And I must say that in Estonia, the citizen science uh, on plants, I think it hasn't, hasn't been carried out before as such. So uh, it was a new experience for all of us. But the Estonian Farm for Nature suggested that this cowslip is really a very good species for such an initiative for many other reasons, that because people know it uh, quite well still, uh, it, the, it has some like cultural value, uh, an important place in our cultural memory. It is also in UK, the county flower or for several counties, um, I noticed. Uh, its, uh, its cultural importance or in our history is also um, illustrated uh, by the fact that it used to have a lot of folk names uh, in Estonia in 1930s. In Estonia, which is so small and we have only 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, inhabitants in Estonia, uh, those times even less, there were uh, more than 100 folk names uh, for, for, this, for this species. Amazing. <laughs> and now we mostly have only uh, Nurmenuk in Estonian, like I think in, uh, in, in, in English as well, it's mostly, you know, under the name of cowslip. But I found a few synonyms such as not uh, with no reference to cow, cows and manure, but uh, uh, instead uh, how it uh, uh, looks like or what does uh, cowslip resemble, key of heaven, bunch of keys. Uh, I don't know about the herb, Peter, maybe you can say, but maybe you know some other uh, synonyms you can think which have been spread once historically in your region. And also it is well-known still in folk medicine. Uh, 
also in Estonia. Uh, and in some countries uh, in Europe, uh, it, it has caused also a lot of problems for cow sleep well-being because, uh, for example, in northern uh, part of uh, Greece over the past years, uh, raiders or, or uh, raids or, or people come across the border during the night time, collect uh, hundreds of kilos of cowslip uh, flowers, take them back across the border and, and then uh, sell them uh, elsewhere to Europe, to Germany, to, to the United States. So it's really uh, now having an impact on these wild um, cowslip populations and authorities in northern Greece, Greece have been forced to take really some serious action. Um, just uh, uh, also that uh, great, great writer of, uh, uh, from your country, William Shakespeare, uh, also uh, seemed to be keen on cowslip as, uh, as, a, as a kind of a symbol of, uh, of, of traditional rural landscapes and uh, has referred to this uh, species in several of his works uh, as a Midsummer's Night Dream and The Tempest. And you can uh, uh, look up and think what does he mean when, when he says that in their gold coat spots you see those dear rubies, fairies, favours, in those freckles lie their sailors. Uh, yes, so very, 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 very beautiful words about Kausi. So we agreed that cowslip is a really good, uh, a good uh, grassland species to, to carry out the citizen science initiative, citizen science initiative. But we were still a bit afraid that this heterostyle and and this this uh, small floral detail, as uh, as uh, Linné uh, put it, that uh, that it, it might scare people off, and uh, we were not we we didn't know what to expect, and thought that maybe. Uh, only we ourselves go out and record the setter style, but surprisingly, it was very warmly welcomed by Estonians who have uh, who are not used to do any citizen science initiatives. And uh, and in we have done it now for two years already. In in 2019, we uh, we uh, received information from more than 1,700 locations. Uh, so people had to go and find a costly population and uh, determine uh, when possible on 100 individuals of cowslips, whether it's a pin or a drum, whether it's an Elmore long style or Esmore short style. Uh, and um, yes, we received a lot of data and we were very positively, uh, positively surprised. And, uh, and amazingly, uh, we also did a, an analysis which was recently published in Journal of Ecology with the help of thousands of, of, of Estonians um, uh, or people living in Estonia. And uh, we found confirmation that, uh, that uh, indeed in smaller populations, the, the frequencies of these morphs are more likely to deviate, while in larger populations, they are more equal. We didn't specifically ask for, to, for people to assess uh, population size of cowslips, but uh, we used some proxies, so we were able to 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 do to, to find some uh, to relationships between population size. And when you will do now, uh, perhaps some of you will look at cowslips. Then you might have you might notice that in the survey there is also a question regarding a rough estimate of population size of cowslips. So it, it is. It is an important, uh, important factor also, not for the general well-being, but also in terms of heterostyling. And another amazing finding, which has not been found before, was that there were systematically more S's, S morphs, short-styled morphs, compared to L's, these long-style morphs or pins. And the same finding was uh, confirmed uh, in, in the second year as well. Uh, as I said, it's not, it has not been found before, so we are really puzzled and we don't know uh, why is it so, uh, why is it, uh, what's happening, uh, is it landscape change? Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we uh, really want to go on with this, to, to see what's happening with this uh, equal ratio, which was first uh, observed by Darwin. And um, yes, and, and another positive thing was that 
but actually, uh, first we were a bit afraid that it's a, such a complicated topic, but we were really happy that the teachers uh, welcomed this idea and, and uh, we received uh, data from numerous hundreds of groups uh, from schools and also even kindergartens. Uh, so you see uh, kids looking at cowslips uh, and um, we saw very nice photos of whole families doing it, particularly uh, this COVID lockdown uh, during the last uh, spring. Uh, everything was uh, closed, no entertainment, so people went to nature and, and did some observations and sent the data to us, which were, we were really happy to have. And another thing was that uh, when there has been a, a topic of, 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 of plant blindness, that, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, seems that, it seems that there's no cowslip blindness, that the people sent us data from all kinds of uh, habitats besides meadows. They found cowslips, uh, also uh, road verges. This was the second most common habitat, but also from, uh, for example, from graveyards. Here you see a photo uh, or taken from a graveyard. There's a, a grave here, and then there are some nice uh, plants semi-widely or uh, growing there. Then also uh, old quarries, for example, and the more uh, maybe funniest or most peculiar places such as uh, the verges of uh, meteor crater, airfields and uh, places, uh, former places for deposition of rubbish. So people certainly noticed cowslips and in such habitats they were so surprised and then happily and uh, positively surprised. Uh, but now coming back to the science part, uh, as Felicity said, that we contacted Plant Life last uh, autumn uh, to see whether UK could be potentially participating in this campaign, as uh, you also have these nice grasslands, uh, you have had them wi uh, widely spread across the country, you have cowslips, also uh, uh, the theory uh, about why there's heterostyling cowslips was suggested by, by Darwin. Uh, and in, 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 in his whole country. So we thought that we, we contact UK. And uh, I was, uh, and we were so happy that, uh, that we received positive feedback and that Plant Life pick, picked up this idea. And uh, then uh, some other countries uh, suggested that perhaps they could also take part in the campaign. And now we received some, uh, some additional funding to translate these materials and adapt the materials into, into many European languages. So now, apparently in this spring, a whole of Europe is going to look for cowslips and, and look, at the, look at the flowers of cowslips and, uh, and help, uh, help us to, to see what's happening in cowslips, how, much cows, how many cowslips are still there in Europe. And, and what's happening along uh, this uh, gradient of, of grassland loss all, all across Europe, and why there are more esmores and, and many other questions. So we have new hypotheses, and I hope that that uh, that that you uh, help us uh, to solve these uh, these riddles or the puzzles. Uh, just a reminder. I, uh, uh, whether you recognize. Uh, which morph is which? Mm. And uh, you are correct when you thought that on the, the picture on the, the, the cowslip flower on the left uh, is a short style morph with anthers visible. On the right, you see a uh, pin or long style morph. When you know this, you can recognize cowslips and you can uh, recognize these two, uh, uh, two uh, flower morphs. You are ready to do the uh, observation when cowslips start to flower. So uh, with the help of, uh, of uh, plant life, I, I hope that many of you will go out and uh, find cowslips. Uh, if you uh, like, do send us also data and just enjoy being uh, being in, outside in nature. So and let's step into the follow the steps of Charles Darwin. I suggest.
So I'm, I, I thank you and thanks for this possibility and, and I would be glad to respond to any questions. And I stop now uh, sharing my screen, yes. Sippy, thank you for a really fascinating um, tour of Estonian grasslands and of your research. Um, I really appreciate you kind of reflecting our culture back into us. I don't know if we've got as many as 116 um, local names for cowslip, but I certainly think I'm going to try and find out. Um, we have a number of questions here. Um, and um, I'm going to start off with this question from Alison Baxter, who is saying, my cowslips are flowering already. Why is this? I don't know whether um, you've got any thoughts on that, Sippy. <laughs> is it really so? <laughs> yeah, we are in such a hurry at the moment, really, indeed, that, uh, that, uh, that we have heard from here and there from the rest of Europe. But that, that cowslips are flowering in the south as we only have some snow outside, you know. Uh, in some cases, it's, uh, it has turned out that it's not actually cowslip. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an, in, in another primula, which starts uh, flowering uh, earlier with this shorter, uh, shorter stalks and more pale uh, flowers, primula vulgaris in, in Latin. You see, I, I have also, there's also one in the cowslip too, actually, you know, <laughs> uh, flowering, but they, they, we, this is, they are flowering because uh, we took them to the greenhouse to, to enhance it. Um, it is also possible, and it is a, as a rule in, in urban environments and in, 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 in town gardens, so they start to uh, flower earlier. And apparently, I don't know what about UK, but in, in Central Europe, there was also warm, quite warm weather recently, so which could, uh, which could also cause it, but uh, I hope, <laughs> well, it's really, I, I have noticed over the past years that they start flowering earlier and, and earlier, it, it, due to exceptionally warm winters, for example, as well. So let's see, but we try to still uh, um, be on the train and, and still, uh, and, and as, 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 as you said, uh, Mary Grace, that the, the app is basically ready, so uh, the, the information, the, the materials, the, the animations are ready as well, so you can start observing. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I love the fact that you're bringing your work home, Sippy, with your pot <laughs> of a cowslip on the shelf behind you. Uh, it's normal office. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a question here. It's about the L and S morphs. Um, does this mean that one type is typically more successful at receiving pollen from the other, or does the direction of pollination also follow a 50-50 split? Uh, it's a very, very uh, good question, and uh, it has been also uh, uh, examined <clears throat> as well. Uh, I'm not, as I'm not uh, really uh, like a heterostyle specialist myself, but uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, uh, these two uh, types uh, of, uh, of, of individuals, they also, uh, for example, produce um, a different number of pollen grains and the, the size of the pollen grain is also different. There are some other things which are different uh, in these two morphs, for example, uh, now I have to remember, one of them produces smaller ones and more and the other one uh, larger pollen grains and less and and also it depends uh, also on the, mm, the pollinator communities. As I said before, the pollinators are crucial. Pollinators can be also long-tongued and short-tongued and, uh, and this composition can also influence it. And uh, there's also one fact uh, which I didn't mention, not to make things too complicated, is that there is always, um, in Stona we have a saying, that there is always an exception for a rule. <laughs> that uh, actually, um, it has been observed that uh, sometimes uh, there is some uh, intramorph uh, fertilization, successful fertilization within L morphs, but not so in S morphs. So, which can have consequences for genetic diversity and uh, and uh, and what what can also happen. Uh, but this is like now really um, forefront of, of science as well that uh, that. Uh, in conditions of extreme habitat loss and extreme pollinator loss, maybe cowslips or some other primulas lose this uh, heteromorphism. They only have 
due to some mutations, uh, one, uh, one uh, morph left, and they are capable of self-fertilization, -fertil really self. So this is, this is, there are many, many uh, questions and many new hypotheses which arise, and there are uh, research groups uh, whom we also hope to get on board who are actually studying this, so we can help, we can get help uh, from researchers who, who help to explain what's going on after getting also data from the rest of Europe, so yes. That is, that's wonderful. I've just noticed that Gillian has, thank you Gillian, has put something in the chat. Um, apparently we have 38 UK local names for cowslip, so Gillian, yes. thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, we have a lot of questions about the actual survey itself, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Um, but we have another uh, question here about morphs. Um, to what extent do you know if the, um, is, are the L and S morph, are they a result of mutation or inheritance? Uh, well, they, uh uh it's um it is uh, again uh, what I'm, <laughs> I'm not myself uh, studying uh, specifically but uh, uh, there are uh, one or two uh, primula groups um, um, studying this um uh, that um, the, that the, uh, this morph type is uh, determined by a uh, gene complex and there are several uh, genes involved so uh, determining whether the, the determining the length of the style and determining the size of the pollen grain and some some other other features and uh, now it becomes more complicated again <laughs> it uh, 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 it is uh, so this, this is uh, genetically determined this s and l and one of them is basically uh, heterozygous for this, uh, these specific traits and the other one is hemizygous as was recently shown. It's like the, the, some, uh, some mutations or deletions uh, taking place which determine it. Uh, and there are like, uh, and there, it is a real field of research like uh, how, for example, might this monomorphism evolve and this fertilization, what mutations uh, take place so that, uh, yes, so this is uh, something that evolutionary biologists are studying at the moment, that how it has evolved uh, genetically, it has evolved, like heterostyle, it has evolved in many other plant families besides, I think 28 plant families besides, uh, besides uh, Primula, so it's, yes. So we've got some questions about the survey, and I'm going to come to you first, Sippy, and then Mary Grace, I wondered if I could hand over to you to talk about the app. So, um, it's really great to see that a lot of people out there are keen to be joining this European survey effort uh, in a few months time. Um, people are asking, should they be doing the survey in their garden or on road verges where maybe cowslips have been planted? Where, where would you recommend people did the survey? What are the kinds of populations you're looking for? And does the size of the place where people are doing the survey matter no not really like we, we uh, uh, what we uh, were aiming at was to look at uh, these grassland populations but the thing is that uh, really cowslips also grow on road road verges and field boundaries and other other uh, habitats which are as important for grassland species as, as the grasslands themselves and and uh, we have suggested that uh, people wouldn't really do uh, an observation in their garden unless it's a semi semi wild uh, garden, semi wild populations. Doing uh, observations on road verges is uh, absolutely fine, but we, of course, uh, it is often not uh, like it, it. It can be it hasn't happened in Estonia. It can be that uh, they they have been like for example sown white flower with uh, white flower seed mixes. But I think uh, it's still uh, it, it, it's uh, I think it's still uh, worth to look at in, in road verges and uh, as I mentioned, like these uh, peculiar places, uh, <laughs> verges of meteor meteorite crater, <laughs> if you have any. But but yes, but not maybe on on your flower beds or not. Yes, but but behind your garden when you see 
sometimes I, mean, I know that there are like semi-wild populations they can escape uh, from the garden and uh, and uh, and sometimes you also uh, because we also ask the people to take a photo at the habitat so we can uh, we can see like whether it's a flower bed or, or it's kind of semi-wild condition so and then yes and the population so we, we are asking if it's possible to look at hundred individuals but when there are less sometimes there's it's 20 and uh, it, it indicates it's a small uh, population small size and uh, and uh, these deviations they indicate something uh, and this environmental stochasticity so on so uh, we very much welcome also the, the information from small populations and I, and I would say um before i hand over to mary grace uh, one of the things i think is really nice about this survey is that it's so accessible um that um, and as you've shown with this, your photos of people doing the survey in Estonia, it really is an accessible piece of community science. Um, and I know um, I've got my parents who are already geared up to go for it and they've never surveyed in their lives. And I think if my parents can do it, anyone can do it. But Mary Grace, can I hand over to you now to just talk about the app? Because that's gonna really help people um, collect data, isn't it? Sure, absolutely. Um, so um, there is an app that you can download um, on our CalSlip survey page on the Plant Life website. I believe Felicity has popped that into the chat um, function. Um, so yes, Plant Life has created a UK CalSlip survey modeled after the Estonian CalSlip survey. Um, and that can be accessed on an app called Survey123. So if you go to the CalSlip uh, webpage, about halfway down, there's a section called how do I download the app? And it walks you through how to download the app and then how to access the UK CalSlip survey form. Um, and yeah, we would encourage you to have a go with it um, when you have happened upon some flowering CalSlips. Um, and yeah, that, what more can I say? Um, we hope that it's user-friendly um, and yeah, if you have any issues, um, I will be adding to that page at some point an FAQ sheet um, with an, an email address on there if you have any issues with the app and you'd like to get in touch with us. But um, is there anything else I'm missing, Felicity, in regards to the app? Um, I think that's it. We've got a question from Rachel that's just come in here. Is the app connected to iRecord? For example, if I enter details on iRecord, will it be useful for this cowslip project? Rachel, thank you for that question. Um, the we've set up we uh, we've set up the app um, as a as a group project, and that's not actually um, set up on iRecord. Um, and because of how the survey st structured. Um, it's probably best in this instance for any information about cowslips if you're doing the survey the data to flow through uh through that pathway we'll be sending the data to sippy and her team at the university of tartu um probably mid-june end of june and we're really hoping that uh the cowslip surveying community of the uk will be able to join us in late autumn when we share the results from across Europe. Um, it is 1.30, um, so we're going to end this webinar now. Thank you, Sippy, for joining us uh, today. And I think being really inspire inspiring, um, there are a lot of unanswered questions. I see. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry about that. What I will do to everybody who's, for everybody who's on this webinar, what I will endeavor to do is look at these questions over the next few days um, and get answers to them. And I'll probably put those answers on our Cowslip webpage. But thank you for joining us. Um, I think we all want to come to Estonia now and look at your grasslands. Actually, before I go, there's one question and we've got Matt. Matt has just started a, or is just starting a juniper restoration project in the UK. Juniper is one of the species we've worked, we work with and we've been working on at Plant Life because our problem in 
in the UK is our juniper population is declining. So it was fascinating to see that you've got a lot of juniper um, in Estonia. Um, Matt, do you just want to say a bit about that project? Yeah, I mean, we're working again across the sort of chalk landscapes of the south of England um, to try and reinstate and reestablish juniper, um, which has declined massively in the UK, um, partly through through changes in management and changes in land use. Um, and the fact that it doesn't readily um, regenerate very easily without disturbance. Uh, so, so we're working to, to create some disturbance on the ground. Um, we're also collecting seed um, from the existing juniper bushes in the landscape, and those are going to be scattered on these areas of disturbance to hopefully let them naturally regenerate. Thank you, Mark. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us um, in our penultimate Spring Into Action webinar. And um, I hope in a few months we'll all be able to be seen across the UK kneeling down and looking at cowslip flowers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I hope I can, uh, after having uh, been analyzed the data from everywhere, uh, perhaps I can give feedback on one day <laughs> as well. Uh, we, we've got you. We've got you signed up for that already. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much then. Bye. Thank you. Bye.